Again, thank you all so much for being here today. There are some of you in the audience who are here who do not yet come to Pepperdine, but we hope you will. Um, so thank you for being here as well. Um, Dr. Majidi, I don't know about you, but you know, imposter syndrome is something that has really been affecting so many of us. And I, I, I kind of want to know, uh, before I put up a poll, I'm going to have a poll in just a couple of, uh, of minutes here, but I just want to know, you know, from your perspective, you know, how have you been, how have you ever experienced imposter syndrome in the past? Is it like today or in general? <laughs> in general. So what we know from the, the literature is that the imposter syndrome is not an ailment. It's not a, 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 a psychological disorder. It's not based on any other test in the DSM, nor is it pathological. It's rather a phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that, that, that many of us experience, and I think our poll will show, roughly three out of four people in, in the majority of the studies that have been conducted on the imposter syndrome report experiencing the imposter syndrome. And in the field, we jokingly say, and the other 25% believe Elvis is alive. So this is alive and well in, in all of us. Um, I will share an anecdote about how I experienced it, You know, one of the major ways I experienced it. Uh, you may not know this, I've been at Pepperdine for a long time and the first um, seven, eight, nine years, and then this goes back to when I started teaching. I started teaching when I was in late 20s. And, and I taught statistics and economics, even though my major, my field of study, my dissertation was only leadership. Because I, I was young and, and I thought to population like yourselves, and I always thought, gee, you know, these guys are older than me. And I come from a culture that emphasizes age as a, as a ladder in the caste system. So if they're older me, they're smarter, they're better, they know more, they have managed longer. So the minute I open my mouth on something so subjective like leadership and management, they'll mock me. I mean, I can't possibly be legitimate. So I chose instead to teach statistics and economics because math is math. Like nobody was gonna argue that the average of two, three and four is three. And that consumed a good 10 years of my career before I finally decided to step in and, and teach in a field that I was really passionate about. Yeah, no, I, I, and I love that you talked about that because for me, um, experiencing imposter syndrome is, is kind of a daily thing. Um, I, I truly believe a lot of the times, and this is something I've done in my research, so um, uh, a lot of, some of you know, some of you are, are in the EIP with me for this term, but uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Majidi and Dr. Gabby and Dr. Rame are both chair and committee for, for us and for me. And so my, my topic is actually to study um, the feeling of inadequacy, which ultimately leads to imposter syndrome. And um, I have to tell you, a lot of the things that I've studied and researched, it's, it starts from our childhood. It starts just, you know, you just mentioned your culture. Um, and you mentioned the fact that, you know, that you know, people are going to look at you and think, oh, well, you know, what do you know about leadership? How could you be able to, to do that? So, you know, you're, you're going to stick with something that no one's going to say anything about, which is statistics and math. And for me, in my case, you know, um, <laughs> I've dived all over everything in the world trying to figure out, well, you know, what, what am I good at? And then as soon as I would see somebody else doing something and they're doing it better than me, I would think, oh, I'm not good enough to do this. And so I would just stop and go somewhere else. And I don't know how many of you in the audience have felt this way. I can definitely tell you, um, I just started my podcast recently about, uh, I'm five episodes in now. So that was about the, uh, the end of March, I began my, my podcast and I was so scared. I actually did my first episode on imposter syndrome. Um, I don't think I told you that Dr. Majidi, did I? <laughs> my first episode was on that. Um, and, and when I did my first episode, I, I was, I, I admitted it to everybody in my audience was listening. And I'm going to even say it here now, when I was beginning this podcast, I was in so much fear of it. And I felt, well, who's going to want to listen to me and who's going to want to listen to my voice. I mean, they're going to look at me and go, what does she know about these things? What does she know about, um, you know, imposter syndrome? What does she, what does she know about women leaders? And what does she know about you know, uh, all of these topics. And so I sat in fear for two years, literally in fear for two years, thinking I wasn't going to be good enough to do this. And so I didn't do it. 
Um, and I let that stop me. Imposter syndrome has this funny way of stopping us from doing certain things. Um, and so I would love for us to show up a poll. Um, and Dr. Gabby, if you can help me with getting that poll up. So um, I just want to know from all of you in the audience right now, have you experienced any of the following symptoms is what we're going to quote unquote say. It's not really a symptom. They're not really real symptoms in the sense of imposter syndrome, because you, you, you will have to understand one thing. Imposter syndrome is actually not listed in any of the psychological disorders in the DSM book, right? It, it is, but there's a lot of different symptoms that are associated with different areas of the DSM, All right, Dr. Majidi? So, so it, the, the imposter syndrome is, is called imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon. It, it's a fairly new field. I think it was in 1978 when Pauline Clance and Susan Imus came up with their article. And then what, ha what the, the genesis of their study was that they taught in schools and in graduate schools, and there were a large number of women that were extremely successful and they were shining in their various field. But when they would talk to them, the women would say, you know, I can't believe I got in. Like, I don't belong here. I don't think my work is, is good enough. So they began exploring and then they discovered what in essence is now called the imposter syndrome. And it's built around failing to meet other people's expectations, you know, like not being accomplished despite what you have in fact accomplished, a sense of as a person, I'm not worthy. I mean, any success that I have is not because I created it and I'm successful and I have abilities, but it's really because maybe I got lucky, maybe, you know, somebody liked me or maybe somebody just threw a bone at me and, and, um, and then that's all it is. And, and we really strongly see it in the workplace a lot more than we do in the family. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to tell you something. Uh, we just did the poll. Thank you so much, Dr. Gabby, for doing that for us. And the poll, 71% um, share that they feel inadequate or not good enough. 71% of, of our audience here. Um, and 34% of our audience has said that they've experienced pretty much all of the above in every way, uh, <clears throat> in shape and form. And then we've got 63% of low self-confidence and 53% low self-esteem. So as you can see, these, these are you know pretty high numbers, right? Um, the feeling of inadequacy, not feeling good enough is definitely, I can relate with that so much um, as, as well as with all of these. And it just, you know, uh, like you were saying, the high achieving women that Dr. Pauline Clance and Dr. Suzanne Imes discussed um, about in their article literally felt that they weren't good enough. They believed that their advancements were just given to them by mere chance or luck. And they just happened to be there at the right time and were scared to the point that they were gonna be found out to be frauds. Um, and I just, like I just shared with you about what I went through in, in getting my podcast out there. I was just, you know, trying to, you know, I was sitting still like in fear of, okay, is this, am I good enough to do this? What are people going to think about me? Um, a lot of the times, the feeling of, of, of being an imposter is really what it is. It's a feeling. It's not necessarily a syndrome, but it became a syndrome later, or it became coined as a syndrome later from being a phenomenon, um, which I, I, I really never understood why. Why did they change it from phenomenon to syndrome? But either way, it is a phenomenon, right? And I, I just wanted to point out the, the, the feeling of inadequacy and then the self-esteem and self-confidence, Dr. Majidi, because I know we're gonna talk about that and we're gonna talk about ways that we can learn to start overcoming the feeling of imposterism and being able to move forward in our life and, and be able to do the things that we wanna do without having to feel you know, inadequate, without having to feel that we don't have the confidence or the abilities to do what we know we have the ability to do, right? And if you experience this, you're in good company. Like if I ask you who is the historical person in terms of the smartest person alive, and then let's pick a man because that would serve my example. Who would you say was, is the smartest man in the history? Einstein. There we go. Albert Alexander, Einstein. Alexander okay. the Great. All right, so Einstein yeah, helps my example, so I'm gonna roll that. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, Einstein once, once called himself an involuntary swindle, swindler, because he has sold the bill of goods and his contributions to science and physics was not nearly as much as he was celebrated. 
And, and if you want an, another example, Maya Angelou, does anybody know how many books she wrote? She's written so many. Didn't she write 11 books? 11 books. Yeah. And this is a direct quote. Mm -hmm. I have run a game and everybody uh, on everybody, and they're going to find out who I really am and who I'm not. And these are some significant historical folks with amazing contributions to our lives. Yet they all share the same phenomenon, the same syndrome. I'm so glad you brought up Maya Angelou because actually she was a quote I used in one of my talks I just recently did on imposter syndrome. Um, and she really talked about it. And she said, you know, I wrote these books and every time I write a book, I, I get scared that I'm going to get found out about. I think we all experience that in one way or another. Um, just <laughs> even when writing my dissertation, can I be real about that? <laughs> you know, you know, and it's just writing my own dissertation. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I'm, once I finish this, I'm going to be found out as a fraud, you know, and, and not, am I doing, you know, am I doing a service, you know, in writing about this, right? And so, you know, these are, and I'm talking about these feelings coming from within me. And I know that all of us in the audience, you've all felt it in some way or another, right? Whether you've written a, a book, a dissertation, an article, or just anything that you've been doing or are doing in your life, um, you know, have you, you know, how you've been able to feel about it, how you've been able to, you know, kind of think like, you know, is, is this something that, you know, am I doing this the right way? Is this, and, and so one of the other things, and I didn't mention this in, in the poll, but one of the other symptoms is perfectionism. And so in the chat, if you can let us know, um, how many of you have dealt with perfectionism and procrastination? Because if you, if you put that in the chat, just say yes or no. And I'm gonna tell you right now, if you felt procrastination and perfectionism, those are definitely two areas um, that also um, are symptoms of imposterism. One is the fact that you want to make sure everything is so perfect before you actually start. And when you when you start doing this project and it's not perfect, you have the tendency to go back and do it again and do it again. And then when the deadline comes in, now you're in trouble. Um, or you procrastinate to the point where you're you keep pushing things off and you're saying, I'm I'm gonna do it later, I'm gonna do it later. When you sit down and actually do it, you don't feel like you can you feel like you're frozen or in paralyzation or paralyzed. I don't think paralyzation is a word. I think I just made that word up right now. <laughs> but yes, so I see a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, our people in our audience have said yes. So absolutely yes, Karen. I um, I rewritten entire papers the night before they were due. Yeah, I, I yes yes. And um, it, it, yes, Bruce, very true. Perfect is the enemy of the good. And so I've definitely felt that. Um, you know, Dr. Majidi, let's, let's talk a little bit about men as well, because, you know, statistically, women are the ones that experience imposter syndrome more than men. However, there's a lot of research out there that talk about men um, also uh, facing imposter syndrome and, and dealing with it. And so, um, you know, how do we, you know, kind of look at that difference? Because there's a couple of differences. And before I start, um, for all of you who have um, questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna leave a little bit of time for questions and answers. And we'll kind of go in and we'll answer those questions. And Chen, definitely we'll get to you for your question. What is the correlation between perfectionism, perfectionism and imposter? Imposterism. So we'll talk about that in just a, a, a little bit, okay? So thank you for answering, but if you've got questions, put them on the chat. So initially when the, the imposter phenomenon came to be, it was strictly studied among men, high achieving women, but now that the field has expanded, there are particular characteristics that you see in, in, in men and women, but some are more stronger in men than women. For example, we know high achievers have a higher proportion of uh, uh, imposter syndrome than not. Folks who are wealthy are disproportionately to the lean towards uh, imposterism. Successful parents, and ironically, children of successful parents feel this double bind. In family business, we know that the, 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 the child that inherits the business after the, the founder puts it together has a very high degree of imposterism. Uh, communities that have been held back or advantage throughout history, they are among them. Um, areas, and this hits home with all of us, 
if you work in professions where being intelligent is critical and it's one of the conditions of being able to, to work in that industry, such as professors, leaders, therapists, counselors, graduate students, invariably suffer from a large degree of imposterism. Now, when we look at differences between men and women, one of the filters we can look, look through is, are they different in temperament? So uh, are, are those the differences between men and women can be expressed in, in their temperaments? And of course, we borrow from Carl Jung's five uh, major personality types or temperaments. Um, men to be tend to be lower in consciousness than women by a little bit. These this differences are minute. So um, low extroversion. So people who are introverts tend to be more highly um, experiencing uh, imposter syndrome than others. And that tends to lean more toward men. High agreeability is another condition that, that's correlated with imposter syndrome. Women tend to score higher on agreeability. Again, uh, differences are not statistically significant, in the, but they are significant. Ability to experience emotion or what's called in the field neuroticism. People with higher degree of ability to express emotions are more susceptible to experience imposter syndrome. And as the part that, that really comes into to the, to the center uh, stage is men are, men are equally available to, to, in, in experiencing neuroticism. The difference is actually larger for women. Men are not as able to express those. So for men, it tends to be like internalized a lot more. It tends to lead to higher degree of depression, higher degree of, uh, or lower degrees of self-esteem. And sometimes it manifests itself also in anger, like quitting in a tantrum, things like that. But the experience is, is fairly significant. And, and narcissism tends to be more present among men than it is among women. And narcissists tend to be more likely to be imposters. Although the next, level in, in that scale. Psychopaths absolutely have very little imposter syndromes. Right, no, and, and I'm so glad you mentioned that. Men, when you, you just said that, you know, men are not able to express that. And I did, you know, I wanted to mention that that's the, one of the reasons why we probably don't have as much research and information as we would like to get on men in imposter syndrome and how they experience it. Because a lot of times they're afraid of, of showing those feelings and, and admitting that they do feel the same symptoms of, you know, not feeling good enough or feeling like they're a fraud, right? Um, and, and the fact that they overestimate their abilities um, and they feel that they're not able to achieve their goals. And so that creates an internal stress within them that also um, creates uh, imposter syndrome in men, especially when they're being given negative feedback. So if you have men that are being given negative feedback. Um, so this is an interesting fact. Women, when, when women are given negative feedback, women actually take that negative feedback and they run with it. They do what they can to, you know, achieve that goal and say, okay, well, I was given this feedback, let me do this. For men, according to the research I've done, it's the opposite. Men actually stress out more. They have a higher rate of stress and anxiety when they're being given that negative feedback. So I thought that was really interesting, um, you know, in regards to what you were saying in regards to all of this research that's really out there about that. And so I hope that there would be more research done in the future for this, yes. Um, I'm sure we wanna get to the good stuff, right, Dr. Majidi, which is how are we gonna overcome these feelings of imposter syndrome? What can we do to empower ourselves? That's the title of our talk, empowering ourselves to overcome imposter syndrome and, and really increase our self-esteem. And I think before we even talk about that, what is the correlation between self-esteem and imposterism? And, and, and why is it so important for us to be able to increase self-esteem and self-efficacy? So it's interesting, the research that looks at self-esteem and self-esteem, self-efficacy and imposter syndrome doesn't find a strong evidence, but if you nuance it, if you increase the resolution and look more deeply, you would see the set of things that generally leads to lower self-esteem also leads to, into higher um, imposterism. Now here, are, and, and, and I wanna share with you briefly some of the some of the socialization that we all experience in our childhood as we as we are raised that that catches up both in terms of low self-esteem and high 
imposterism. So there are two stages of our life, two stages of our personality development, and this is the work of Eric Erickson that, that really impacts both self-esteem and, and imposterism. The first one is in the, in the, right about the age you are in preschool, three to five years of age. This is when you develop as part of your growth, your sense of initiative versus guilt. Now, in a more practical way, this is where you decide that everything in the world that doesn't work, like as a baby, you can take care of yourself. And as a two, three, two-year-old and before three-year-old, you can't do anything right. They're always told not to do this, sit down, et cetera, et cetera. Then you get to about three to five years of age and things that happen, you internalize as, oh, it's not like things are wrong. It's just that it's me that's wrong. I'm not good enough to do things. You see, parents tell me to do things that don't come naturally. Like, I want to turn the TV. They're like, no, 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 put the remote on. You shouldn't touch that. Or I have to ask permission to do the most mundane things. I can't have ice cream when everybody else is having ice cream. And then two particular things that deal with uh, actually food and going to the bathroom. They are fairly profound too. Like if as a child, boy or a girl, you're told to go to the bathroom when you don't want to go to the bathroom. I don't know about you guys. That was always my kiss. We were going to go visit my aunt. I'm 60 miles away. And mom would say, go to the bathroom. And I, said, I don't want to go. Go anyways. Go try. Or, or come and eat dinner. But I'm not hungry. Come and eat anyways. As soon as I put everything else away, you're going to want food. Very legitimate issues. The three to five-year-old human child will internalize this as, huh, mom, dad, my major caretaker, who is lowercase g, God, I mean, they can make decisions, they can drive cars, they can have anything they want. They're telling me I should have some body sensation that I'm not having. Huh, that's on me. Really, I, you know, I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm not decent enough. Or um, really, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't do things because if I do, I mess them up. So that becomes the first foundation of our sense of inadequacy and fakeness. And, and then you graduate to six to 11 year old where all the comparisons begin. You know, like um, you do feel at school and get a B plus and you come home and your primary caretaker would say, well, that's nothing. You know, it's okay, your cousin always gets AIDS. Or you are not as your older sibling or you're not as good as the, you know, somebody else at school. And the constant sense of comparisons derives a feeling of inferiority in you. So it's not just I'm not good enough, I'm not as good as anybody else. And the way we develop strategies internally, defense mechanisms, if you will, to cope with that, affect our self-esteem and our imposterism about the same way. For example, one of the ways we do that is we give up. All right, if I can manage to disappear, if I manage not to be seen, if I manage to always like go sit somewhere in the room where nobody sees me or, or nobody like can, can find me out, then nobody will discover how inadequate and how phony I am. Or if I always do what you're supposed to do, but be the good kid, the, the, the proverbial goody two shoes, then nobody will discover what a phony I am. Both of these deteriorate not only your self-esteem, but they become the foundation of you grow up and you don't shed these two voices in your head that constantly remind you you're not good enough and you're not as good as someone. So just hide, just go away. You're never going to be real. And even if you do something, it's never good enough or never as good as. And that starts deteriorating over and over and over by iteration, by attrition, your self of sense that led, leads to low, higher imposterism and lower self-esteem. Absolutely, absolutely. Our childhood affects, our childhood and what we're taught, what we're taught, what we're told to do really affects who we are and how we are when we grow up, especially when it comes to our self-confidence and our self-esteem. And those studies are very much um, in tandem with um, why the development of imposter syndrome occurs. So what we really need to focus on now is how do we stop the unlearning, right? I, if, if we were to say it in that way, right? The unlearning of what we were taught from a young age. So if our parents were teaching us this is what you have to do. This is what you need to do in order to look, you know, to, to be accepted in our eyes. Or society is telling us things. That's another thing. Our identity, who we are, comes from what we're taught, what we're being told to do, what 
what our environments teach us, what our society teaches, us, what are the norms, you know? And so, you know, for somebody, for example, who, you know, might look at, for example, you know, from, from a young age, I was constantly made fun of and, you know, was constantly told, you know, negative things about, about my body being, being that I was a, a chubby child when I was young and that stuff stayed in my brain. And so growing up, I struggled with weight. I struggled with, with trying to look like everybody else. And to this day, do not, you know, still struggle with weight. Right. And these are all things that affect our self-esteem it affects who we are. And then it kind of comes up with that ultimate result of, are we good enough? Are we good enough for society to accept us, to accept our identity, to accept who we are? Are we good enough to get this promotion, to get this job, to be a doctor, to be a teacher, to be a professor? Are we good enough for all of this? Ultimately, we have to work on our self-esteem. And the more we continue to raise our self-esteem, the more we work on ourselves by unlearning everything, and relearning new concepts, new ways to build ourselves. I, I believe that will be the way to overcome imposter syndrome and to start creating new, accept, new, new patterns, new, accept, new exceptions or acceptabilities in our life. I don't know if I'm saying that correct, correctly, but to accept ourselves in a new way is what I'm trying to say. Um, and what I wanted to kind of say is it, it, as far as kind of how I've been experiencing overcoming imposter syndrome has been to start kind of giving ourselves the permission, to, especially for me, like I have to give myself the permission to feel the way I feel. You know, it's okay that I, I, I felt like, you know, am I going to be able to do this or not? Like, you know, feeling nervous, feeling anxious. It's okay that I felt that way, right? And so I'm giving myself the permission to say that it's okay, but now I'm also going to give myself the permission to let that feeling go and to say, okay, it's now time for me to, to accept myself as somebody who is knowledgeable on this topic, who can talk about this topic, who can, who can be a speaker, who can be a presenter, who can write, you know, books, so forth, you know? And so I believe that when we give ourselves the permission to feel the way we do, to accept that, and then to start by learning new ways and new concepts of overcoming the feeling of not being good enough and to start feeling that we are good enough, that we have the self-esteem, that we're gonna be able to open ourselves to a brand new way of looking at things. Um, at Swaylin, The Four Agreements was is my favorite book. I have three copies in my in my book in my closet right now in my little book box. And I keep giving this copy of books away to everybody because I love um, the four agreements. And one of the agreements that I really liked is the fact that everybody is coming with their own issues and, and everybody has their own maps, but we don't have to agree to what other people are agreeing to. And that that's going to be your first step of increasing our self-esteem and, and working towards overcoming it. So there are a couple of other things that, that I like to add. One is, in addition to our childhood socializations, there is a broader socialization. There is intergenerational trauma. There is dominant culture normalization. There are a number of phenomena that we experience in our growing up, aside from our experience in school and with our parents. And two things happen when the two voices, the, the socialization and the internal voice merge. So people who are highly skilled, people who have abilities and natural talents, things come for them easily. And when it comes to easily, they think that, huh, I'm sure everybody else is just like me. This comes easily to them too. So if I'm really, really, really good at math and I can do math really well, surely everybody else can do it too. So whoop de do. And I've been told all along to, to yield to my older sibling or to not speak up as a member of a particular community, uh, especially if the community is under advantage. Or I've been told that, you know, like I never forget when, um, uh, you know, when my daughter was young, um, she once got in trouble and her punishment was to read books. And I'm like, well, what, you know, what is this? Well, she can't do math, so she should read books. So when these messages are constantly, constantly reinforced through various means, it, we internalize that. And since our talents come naturally to us, we don't think we actually have those talents. There is a term in the field, and I can't pronounce this well enough, pluralistic ignorance. And it's the notion that we doubt ourselves 
without ourselves privately. We don't like to confess to that or to share that. And as such, we are unaware that everybody else doubts themselves too, that this comes up. That then, you know, the 75% of us admit to that, to, to having these things, that's a huge number of the population. So one of the ways we can overcome this is to overcome two voices in our head. One is that voice of the dominant parent, the dominant influence that said, hey, you know, be careful, you can't do this on your own. You're not good enough yet. You're not as good as so-and-so and so-and-so. That every time that voice comes up, we recognize it as a, as a truth, but as a warning sign, like be careful, don't fail, but not that you're not good enough. And the second thing is to recognize how prevalent this is, to recognize that this is not that there is something wrong with you, it's just the way the world is, the way socialization is. So being able to articulate it, being able to hear it from people. Asiya and I decided to start this by confessing to our own versions of imposterism. It's just that to, to, to take away the, the monster-like image of it. Now, we all have challenges with what we do and what we do not. That's how we have been brought up. That's how I've been normalized in many ways. And as such, and, and, and Asiya, tell me if I'm jumping too far ahead. <laughs> The issue of you are not good enough can be objectively measured and assessed aside from our own internal evaluation. Right? So if learning technology comes to me naturally, I can hook up computers and I can do things and I think, well, everybody can. I'm not doing that. Any, I, anything I do is not a big deal. We can get external validation. We can take a look at what we're doing. We can take a look for all of us. We can take a look at our research. We can take a look at our papers. And we can take a look at other people's research, in, not in a contest of who is better or worse, but to be able to objectively assess our capabilities. If our sense of inadequacy and fakeism matches the data, then, then we are inadequate and fake. Like if our papers are really garbage and, 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 and that's commensurate with our skill, well, that's what it is. But if it's not, if the objective assessment of our skills actually suggest that not only we are not fraudulent, but rather we have a high degree of efficacy, then it behooves us to believe ourselves, to believe the objective version of it as well as the personal narrative. That association of reality, the measurable part of your efficacy with your perception of your efficacy is the major component of overcoming this. Absolutely, absolutely. You really it's there's a lot of work that has to be done internally within us but we can do it and as we're working towards that one of the things i will definitely remind everybody is it's going to take one percent of effort a day right one percent of effort a day to change our thoughts to change our our ways our behaviors the the cognitive effects of of what we see when we're, we're thinking about how to increase our self-esteem and our self-efficacy how to you know create good habits and good behaviors, good ways to to discuss and to talk about things. I don't think you jumped at it at all, Dr. Majidi. In fact, you really um, hit hit the nail on the head, so to speak, there in in the sense of that you know this is you know this is the type of work that needs to be done, right? And you know it, it's it, it you have to really start off with internalizing, looking at yourself, looking within you. And, and, and at some point you have to stop listening to what other people are saying to you. You have to stop listening to what others are saying because if you're, if you're gonna believe someone else is gonna look at you or think about you in a specific way that is negative to your own thoughts and well-being, it's going to definitely affect you. You're going to uh, behave in a way then that will let people know that, you know, maybe, you know, that's how you identify yourself to be then that's how you have to be. So you have to change your percep perceptions. You have to change the way you think you have to change the way you look at yourself, your consciousness, you know, your habits. And, and uh, I have a background in hypnotherapy. One of the things that we learned um, was that 88% of our self is, of our, of our thought power comes from our subconscious. So if you can just start doing 1%, and I'm just saying 1%, because no one's going to jump in just literally tomorrow, you're going to change your life, right? It's not going to happen like that. But if you're able to jump and change 1% of 
one thing for yourself, starting right now today, that 1%, it's going to start to develop and evolve over time. And you will find yourself not feeling inadequate anymore. You'll find yourself, in fact, feeling good enough. You have to change your, your mental thoughts. So reframing your thoughts, reframing your mindset, you, you have to think about it, think about you in a different way. And it takes time because, I mean, it took me so much time to learn new ways of, of thinking and being and doing. And there are days that I will still struggle with it. I will be honest, right? And, and so how, how do you, you know, what do you do on the days that you do struggle? Well, you would accept it and then you move forward to the next hour or the next minute where now you're going to say, I'm going to overcome that struggle and I'm going to move to the next 1% in, in order to overcome the feeling of imposterism and increasing your self-esteem. And also I see, and then several people in the chat mentioned the inner voice. Yes. The inner voice that we have that comes from traumatic, ex mildly traumatic experiences that we suffered in a moment of vulnerability as part of growing up, generally to our primary caretaker, then it, then it becomes a safeguard to our head. So like, if you were fooled and people laughed at you, that's gonna go into the, the shorter circuit in your amygdala and, and whenever another scenario like that comes up, it's like red alert, red alert, you're gonna get fooled. And those voices are there to protect you, but they become you then there is no you in you. You don't make conscious decision determinations and paths to take. You listen too much to them. It's almost like the, the alarm becomes your being as opposed to you using the alarm. So what if those voices are wrong? What if those voices that say, you know, Farzine's daughter should, you know, read books, not math is wrong. What if the voice that says you're not good enough is wrong? What if the voice that says you're not as good as is wrong? Is it or isn't it? You get to choose. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. And as Asiya said, give yourself that permission to shine. Give yourself that permission to, to um, excel. And in order to do that, there is one thing you have to give up. You have to give up the fear of making mistakes. So the whole perfectionism piece, and if you've had classes with me, you know I bag on you. I said, you know, don't, don't go around saying I'm a perfectionist. You don't get a, an honor badge. Like that's almost a pathology, right? Because perfectionism is fear of making mistakes to the degree that you're always afraid to be exposed. And as such, you believe your own. Okay, I couldn't say the word I wanted to say. Nonsense. <laughs> Right. Well, I guess when we talk a lot about imposters and we can't say certain words, I've been. <laughs> and, and Bruce in the chat has the excellent idea that you, you give that inner voice a name. All right? yeah. So whenever that yak, 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 yak starts with, oh, be careful, you know, like, don't, don't trust this, don't do that, et cetera, et cetera. If you give it a name, you, you take it from monster level to human level. I love the chipmunk. I love a name that's not imposing. That whenever it gets going, that you can say, ah, cute, go away. Try that. You don't believe me, try that. Don't call it Farzine, by the way. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. that was hilarious. <laughs> well, Dr., I guess we know what Dr. Gabby likes to talk, <laughs> likes, likes to say. Oh my gosh, I love this. I love this. That's so funny. But it's true. And I love that idea too that Bruce um, you know, provided to us today about the fact that we should name our negatives inner critic. We should name, you know what? If you do, you actually humanize the aspect of, mm -hmm. of what's happening inter internally. Um, and you're talking about like the Mag, did you say Magdalena? Is that what you're trying to say? Or Mag, I don't know what word you're saying about our brain. I, I'm, but I, what I'm going to say this, it's 88% of our subconscious. And that's where all of the things that we learn come in. And if we can go in and start working on changing that subconsciousness, right? And, and we start to reframe our thoughts. We start to look at things differently. Um, you know, I'm going to invite you. 
And I think this is going to be a great call to action right now for all of us because I am looking at a time and I want to have time for us to some, do some questions and answers. Um, and so I'm going to do a quick call to action here. And I know, Dr. Majidi, I would love for you to also join me in this quick call to action. But one of this is to start changing you, the way that you think about yourself and the way you start to think, to change the way you think about yourself is by changing the negatives that come up. So if you're, if someone is telling you something along the lines of, oh, what, you know, are you sure you're going to be able to handle this? Because there's a lot of math involved. Well, rather than listening to this person and starting to feel this internal, oh yeah, I mean, maybe I might not be able to. You instead reframe and say, absolutely, absolutely, I can do this. And there's nothing that can say that I can't. And if there's something I don't know how to do, I can research it and find out, or I can ask for help. By the way, perfectionists do not like to ask for help. I was one of those people. So when you were talking about perfectionism, Dr. Majidi, I literally like was raising my hand because I talked about perfectionism quite a bit before. And um, I was a perfectionist a long time ago and I had to learn that that was never gonna work for me. And so I, you know, really, really, really needed to just kind of say, hey, you know, I, nothing's going to be perfect in the world. God didn't make the world to be perfect for a reason. He could have, but he didn't. So I'm going to kind of put it in that perspective is that if we're not made to be perfect, we're just made to be human. And it's okay if something doesn't work out and it's okay to ask for help. And so when we get into that perfectionistic mode, we need to learn to ask for help. In fact, that's going to counter the imposter syndrome. Because when we ask for help, we're giving ourselves that permission to know that it's okay. And we might not know everything or we might not be able to handle everything that's on our plate, but it's okay. And to be able to, to do that. You know what I mean? Um, so, so my call to action to you is change the way you think about yourself and change how you look and perceive others in the world as well while you're looking at yourself. Because when you change yourself, you also change the way you look at the world. That will help you with increasing your self-esteem, that will help you with overcoming perfectionism, that will help you to overcome the imposterism that you deal with. Because you don't want to be, you don't want to have any of this on your plate. So I'm going to call some of you on on this. So the part of uh, growing up that I shared with you when you're told that don't do this, don't do that, you're not as good as, one of the defense mechanisms we adopt is rationalization. Like we will argue to death over our point of view, <laughs> right or wrong. So I'm willing to bet you, if statistics are correct, there are 50 people, so about 15 of you are going, yeah, that's all good, but it doesn't work because like in my life, the way like in the institution I am in, the family I have, the way I was, this isn't gonna work and like you can, I tried this, I took that uh, guru's class and I took that seminar over there and this is not what it is. Okay, that's not you talking, all right? That's the chipmunk talking. The chipmunk can put a pretty good act on and can be very convincing. But you get to choose, choose to change the conversation. And this choice is really, really hard. Uh, very quickly, this is gonna take like a minute and a half. Those of you who remember me, I used to weigh 350, 60 pounds and then and, and I lost all the weight with, with diet. And, and people say, how long did it take you to lose that weight? And one of the ways I answer is my diets were about three hours long. What do you mean diets? Because I could only diet two, three hours before I would see food, get hungry, crave food. And I had to talk myself back into it. And I had to like renew, review, renew, recommit. Every three, four hours. And okay, every three, four hours, I would, you know, the voice would take over. Go ahead, you know, have a bite of this, you know, or have some rice. You can diet tomorrow, etc. And I have to stop and say, no, I'm going to do this for three more hours. Mm -hmm. And three more hours, I get to eat something, and then I would get to do this for three more hours. You don't have to go from here to Rome in one leap. Short bursts of success. And that becomes your norm. And pretty soon, the voice of the chipmunk, see what you did, Bruce? The voice of the chipmunk become something that's your partner, your friend, not your biggest enemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Majidi, um, I love that you just talked about that because this is, uh, you know, I, I, I struggle with weight myself. And so 
you talked about three hours and that really comes down to that same 1% concept of you got to take it 1% at a time. Don't jump in and say tomorrow's going to be the way I'm going to change, change the rest of my life. You do have to, you do have to work on 1% at a time. Um, so that's going to be the call to action. Work on 1% at a time. Make sure that you're reframing, re, you know, reframing your thoughts and your mindset, um, recommitting. I, I just want to invite all of you to just look at yourself right now and just say, you know, I'm good enough. And I'm not a big fan of uh, affirmations. I know for some affirmations work for me, affirmations, and I know what works for me and what doesn't work for me. Affirmations, you know, don't work. But if you start to at least believe in your, in, in the thought of I'm good enough for this, I'm good enough for this. And one thing I want to, I actually will, this is something I do, I did give before um, as an, as an example in a few other talks I've done on imposter syndrome, I'm going to give all of you the same thing here. Then we're going to get right into questions and answers. So I apologize for the time here, but one of the things that you can do right now to help you overcome imposter syndrome is to create an evidence-based journal. Okay. So let me explain what evidence-based journal means. What that means is this, you, it, for those of you who like writing journals, if you don't grab a white sheet a white printer paper sheet and a pen and start doing this when you get when you get the chance like immediately after we're off to the call today I want you to take the journal and I want you to write out at least five accomplishments that have been done in the last two to three years in the last two to three years yes you are going to do that you're going to do that you're going to write out your accomplishments the reason is because the minute you start to think oh I'm not good enough I can't do this Go, you have a journal that shows everything that you've done. All of your accomplishments are listed out. And if you want to go as far back as maybe five or six years, I don't think mentally we could really think so far back. But I mean, if you can really think far back 10 years, do that. But whatever it works for you, write at least, a, at least five, at least five accomplishments that you've done in the last two years, right? So for those of you who just finished your dissertation, write out one of my, your accomplishments was you wrote out a whole dissertation. That's a book that can be published anywhere, okay? So you write that out. And if your second accomplishment is that you were able to get two clients and you made a, a certain amount of money, you write that down. Always have that, you know, that log, okay? Like what Bruce, Bruce, thank you for saying that you have that log. So write it down and then keep it with you. And also another thing you can do too, is when somebody gives you a compliment or somebody says you did a really great job on this project or on this assignment or whatever it was that you're doing work or school or personal, take that. If you get a text about it, or if you get an email, screenshot it, save that, print that, put it in, in your journal and keep it with you. Because these are things that you're going to look into whenever your brain, whenever your monkey brain starts to say, oh no. And that's why I said monkey brain. Cause of, you know, chipmunks right there. Right. Whenever you start to feel like you're not good enough, you can't accomplish or do something, you've got evidence in front of you. And that's why I said evidence-based. So it is, uh, Melissa, it is five accomplishments in the last two years, if you can go that far. Now, if you want to go further back, you can go further back up to 10 years. I mean, it's, it's whatever you remember, but I say at least write down five accomplishments in the last two years. Uh, yes. How many of you know Dr. Betty Uribe? who uh, is a graduate of EDOL and, and is on the board of uh, visitors for the university. Come on. She is executive vice president or some higher level at a major bank. I forget the name of the bank. Uh, she has written a book called Hashtag Values, a, a national prominence in women in leadership and what have you. And I have her permission to share this. She was in a class, you know, in our 724 class, for those of you who are in the program. And, and we were talking about self-esteem and we did that very, very exercise. So write five things you have done in the past five years, one a year, and she couldn't write a thing. She couldn't write a thing. Mm -hmm. And we got into a conversation. I go, okay, now before you even think, when did you get your master's, your MBA four years ago from where it's a very prestigious university? Um, what are you doing? I'm studying my doctorate. What is your uh, position now? I am this. And then, and then, then once she caught on that she's been telling herself what she does doesn't matter because it's not good or it's not good enough or it's not as good as. And then she's fake and this happened and that happened and she doesn't deserve it. Once she gave that up for five minutes, I couldn't get her to stop. Like, okay, good, good, good. Now, you know, two pages is enough. And, and I'm joking. Now, but, and if you ever get a chance to talk to her, 
she will tell you what difference that made in her life. See, a bunch of you, when you got in this program, you thought, oh, I got in because like Pepperdine admits everybody. Or, you know, they badly needed me or they badly needed something or they didn't have enough, et cetera, et cetera. And by believing that, you dismiss your accomplishment and then you don't list it as something you have done. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. I love that. And yes, Dr. Um, Dr. Betty works at, at JP Morgan and Chase. Um, I, and so I know she was going on, she was going out of town somewhere with them. So with that said, let's go ahead and, and get some questions and answers. And we've got just like a few minutes left. So um, for all of you who are still staying on, thank you so much. Um, we might go over by a little bit, but I want to respect everybody's time. Um, and I want to introduce you to our team before we leave, but we've got a few questions that came into the chat that I love to go ahead and, um, you know, um, you know, kind of have us answer. So one of the first things that I saw coming into the chat here was on by, by Chen, what is the correlation between perfectionism and imposterism? And so the correlation is, and Dr. Maggi, feel free to just jump in whenever you want to, but the, the correlation that I've seen in terms of what I've experienced is that when you feel that you're not good enough, then the work that you're doing won't feel that it's good enough until it's done perfectly. And that's the short way of answering that question. Yeah, ditto. Because you believe you're not, you're not the real thing and you're phony, anything you release Anything you reveal, people will reveal, go, oh, no, 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 this person is phony. So you can't let go, no matter how good it is. You can't let go and you want to make it better and make it better to make sure that you're not discovered. But if you start from, I am who I am and this is my work, good, bad, or indifferent, then you free yourself of that chain. Absolutely. So I hope that answers your question. The next one is, what is the correlation to high performers and imposter syndrome? Does this syndrome push them to higher performance? And is it true that high performers are less happy? Let me answer this last question on, is it true that high performers are less happy? Um, high performers are not, I, I haven't seen any documented evidence that they're less happy or more happy. Um, I think what happens is the more high performance somebody is, the more they kind of put themselves in that stress of, we have to constantly keep ourselves up here. The minute we drop down to an, a different level, it's it, we're not now we're not good enough so we got to keep achieving we got to keep going um does it mean that they're less happy or more happy possibly possibly they might not be as happy because they have to keep stressing out or keep putting themselves at, at a higher level like that um but sometimes some people are very happy being in that level and they want to constantly achieve goals because it's just a drive for them um, and so the other two questions dr Majidi, do you feel like you can answer those the correlation to high performance and imposter syndrome and whether it pushes them to higher performance. Yeah, so uh, Asiya's point is very well taken and, and, and it depends how you define high achievers and how you define happiness. Our own Dr. Cesar Vance, uh, in his book, uh, Happiness Guide to High Achievers, he in his study, high achievers were people who had, I think $20 million or more net worth or had a major accomplishment and he measured the degree of happiness using looking at the selling man happiness inventory. So 92% of high achievers reported below norm for their group and very low happiness score. Only 8% of high achievers reported happiness in their lives. And the 92% that were unhappy high achievers suffered from symptoms that will also be consistent with the imposter syndrome, but mainly low self-esteem. Because you're right. not doing anything for your own enjoyment. Everything is to prove that you're actually legitimate. Nothing you do is fulfilling. Everything you do is to prove you're not a phony. Yeah, and that can cause a lot of stress, you know. Um, and so, again, happiness is something that is a whole different study, of course. But given that, you know, I, hopefully that, that answers your question in that regards, because there is definitely a lot. I think there's more research that needs to be done on this, too. Um, Sam asks, is there a component of systemic scrutiny, either originating imposter syndrome for some or perhaps just exacerbating it? Tell me what, I, I think I know what you mean by systemic scrutiny, but tell me what you mean so everybody else understands. So Sam, if you can, if you are on, go ahead and unmute your mic and, you know, talk to sure. us. 
I was just curious if there was, you know, correlation or causation based on systemic scrutiny. So, um, you know, uh, gender bias or, uh, you know, the definitely among minorities or non English speakers or immigrants, homophobia, you know, there is a systemic issue. And I was curious if any of the data, um, you know, exposed any of those particular areas or a different component of imposter syndrome for people where, you know, there, Glennon Doyle is a good example of someone who came from a family where she thinks she won the parent lotto, her family was fine. And yet at eight years old, she became um, bulimic and had all of these identifiable issues, but it wasn't because of a traumatic childhood or trauma. So I was curious if your data uncovered any of that. So I don't know that literature in terms, I don't know that research literature well enough. But what I can tell you though is dominant group normalization. So if you come to, to my country of Iran, everybody will look like me, everybody will have my same wonderful sense of humor and everything else, and you would be out of place. So you're always playing catch up. So playing catch up in everything you do, no matter how well you do it, since it's not conforming to the dominant normal, normalized culture would be inadequate. So you're always playing catch up. And then that reinforces the sense of uh, um, imposterism. But I don't know the literature, uh, research literature well enough to, to, to quote someone. Yeah, and um, I, I also, in my research that I've been doing thus far on imposter syndrome and the feelings of inadequacy, um, there is, I'm going to say there's a little component of it. I haven't seen actual data or numbers in that, but the component of it really does come from childhood, which can exacerbate imposter syndrome depending on how you were raised, also your culture, also what you know was was being given to you. So those could be, um, you know, obviously factors. But there's more research is going to be done on that, of course, and I'm still looking for more research on that as well myself. So great question, and thank you so much for for that answer, Dr. Mujidi. Um, and so th does anybody have questions for, to ask us, you know, cause we'd like to give an opportunity there's, for all of the chat. There's another one in the, okay. in the, in the chat, uh, from Manuel Raya. Okay. Looking at social learning theory, we model our behavior based on the actions of those around us. Is there a correlation between imposter syndrome and first generation college students, given that they didn't have models from which to learn? So intuitively, then again, then, then my answer is also yes. When you're a first generation anything, in my case, I was a first generation immigrant to the United States. And, and no matter how well you master the language, you still do cultural translation, not literal translation. So the, the, you know, the joke we had when we were putting this series together, I, want, I meant to say elevate voices and I said raise voices. That translates culturally to the same thing, but roof and ceiling mean the same thing, the way I was brought up. So we had like raise all this as though people were angry and shouting. So all the time when you're facing a situation where we have to conform to the non -norm, to a norm that's not your norm. If you're the first kid to go to college, if you're the first kid not to have a cell phone at school, if you're the first kid who comes from a multi-household family, Etc. that puts you at a deficit immediately. And kids are mean in school. I remember what, it was, what a brutal jungle it was to go to <laughs> middle of school and high school. So yeah. those reinforcements also deteriorate you. And there is not a role model. There's nobody doing it right for you to even catch up where, well, there is a solution. So it becomes somewhat of a downward spiraling um, conversation. Yeah, and, and and the short answer could be yes. Um, and there has been research. There's still research being conducted, and it really depends on the, the the college students and the type of industry they're getting into. So, for example, in STEM, there's absolutely an issue, um, a, a correlation with imposter syndrome and first generation college students, um, especially those who are entering the STEM field, because a, a lot of times they you know they don't have that model. They don't have somebody coming from that same field, so they don't really have. Um, anyone really kind of saying to them, oh yeah, this is the right way to do this, or you're doing a great job. And so there is that correlation and there's obviously a lot more studies based on that. So um, the short answer is gonna be a yes in that sense, but also there are ways that 
you know, I, I was a first generation college student, I guess, in terms of my mom, um, even though her brothers were well educated, she wasn't. Um, but I, I didn't necessarily feel the imposter syndrome because of that. I think for me, when I first started college, the imposter syndrome came from the fact that I felt other people were smarter than me. And that affected the way I looked at. And in, in fact, my GPA, when I graduated from my undergrad was a two points, almost a 2.6, it was really bad. And that was all based off of what I went through with imposter syndrome, given the fact that I didn't feel good enough. And I felt like everybody else was so smart than I was. And so that definitely affected me. So yeah, you know, we model, you know, definitely, it can definitely affect us first generation as well. So Renee, you have your hand raised, go ahead and, um, and uh, you know, open up your mic and, and get, let us know what your question is. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you for hosting this. This is absolutely amazing. And it's definitely an issue that is so prominent in our, cult in our culture. So I truly do appreciate it. And um, it's something that I have struggled with, I think, um, throughout my life. Our stories are kind of similar, AJ, as far as like uh, the experiences in grade school and stuff like that. Um, can you all speak a little bit more whenever it comes to the comparison and some strategies, like some practical strategies to be able to help to overcome that? Because I find I um, uh, sometimes I find myself in those situations of automatically um, meeting people and going, oh, they're they're better than me. They're smarter than me. You know, that immediate comparison that I didn't recognize until today. So thanks for that. But <laughs> <laughs> but just being able to kind of look at that and say, what are some strategies to be able to overcome that when it comes to imposter syndrome? Additionally to what you've already said. Good question. So help me out. Let's anchor this if that's in something that's very strong in your life. Is there a prominent value that's really strong for your life, such as faith or such as belief in something? Yes, um, I would say my faith, my faith. Okay. Would be. Right. So uh, may I use Christianity as, as, the, as the, the faith in which I'll use my example? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. So, and then this is true. I, I, am, I was raised a Muslim, so I know basic tenets of, of both faiths. So, the fundamental assumption is that you are created as a child of God in one of many different images in which God reveals himself to us. Yes. Okay. Anything, anything fake about that? No, I feel like there's not. No. Can you embrace that as you? That every day you wake up, you go to the mirror and you say, I'm a child of God. God's not fake, nor am I. Yes, yes. Okay. And five minutes later, when the chip one gets to you and goes, hey, you know, that was a, that's some <laughs> academic nonsense. And look, they're staring at you. I, I noticed that you're a member of a minority group. And in this country, we don't always celebrate our differences. And da 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 da, -da when the yak, yak, yak begins, what's your weapon? I am a child of God. God is not... Um... God is not fake and not Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I like that. Thank you. Right. So just to kind of put it in, I was putting in a link um, for all of you um, to go ahead and uh, take our survey. Apparently the link is not working. I apologize for that. So what I will do is I will go ahead and, and no worries, Bruce, um, we are actually almost about to end as well. Um, but I will go ahead and um, I will email all of you, everybody that's registered with the link to take the survey, just to kind of give us feedback and let us know what you thought about our events. And if you're also interested in being a part of our events, um, I, I'm just, I love our conversation, Dr. Majidi. I wish that we could keep going. And I feel like we have so much to talk about. We will go, keep going with all of you and all of you are here today. And so I just want to say thank you so much, everybody, for just being here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Majidi, for um, partnering with me in speaking about imposter syndrome and really providing everybody so much information um, about this very important topic today. Thank you so much for the time you trusted with us. Time is, as you know, I always say, time is the only commodity we can never gain back. So for that, I'm grateful. Absolutely. So before you all leave, um, let me go ahead and, and introduce you over to our team. If I can get this PowerPoint up, give me one second here. 
Um, give me one second here to do this. Of course, when I need it to work, it doesn't want to work. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I, I sometimes I think that our computers are also going through their own version of imposter syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to uh, have all of you meet our team today. Thank you um, to our team for just kind of being for being here and and letting us um, you know get this event going. Thank you all um, so much for for coming on today. I'm seeing everybody's chat, so you're so welcome, everybody. Um, so here is our team. Uh, of course, you see Dr. Majidi and myself are a part of this team, and then we've got uh, our, our very own Dr. Gabby. We've got Dr. Maria Brame. We've got Melissa, Kim, and Dr. Sonia and Ida. All of us are just so happy to have you um, all. You know help us out and be a part of us and be a part of our team. Um, and we just want to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of our conversations. I know that a lot of you may have had questions to ask or may have wanted to be more involved in, in the chat. And so hopefully we'll do another one of this and, and we'll get you more involved. But Dr. Majudi, do you have any last words to say before we um, you know, sign off? Uh, no other than Never forget, never forget. Never forget, that's a good one, I love it. Never forget and please everybody take those call to actions that we just told you about and start implementing them today. Um, Dr. Gabby, Dr. Maria, do any of, do the both of you have anything that you want to, um, you know, shout out today before we, before we end our session? Um, I want to thank everybody for attending. Thank you so much for giving up a bit of your Friday evening to be here with us. We appreciate it deeply and broadly. Your questions really energize our conversations. And, um, you know, based on this uh, response, maybe we can do another kind of version of the same topic, which I think is so relevant and so important to many of us. Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. And I'm just going to ditto what everyone has already said. I'm forever grateful for these opportunities, for the chance to continue to elevate the voices of our community, um, for having you all here and being part of this journey. Um, and so, as always, upwards and onwards. Absolutely. And just to let you know quickly, I've got a couple of questions about recording. Yes, this is being recorded. So you will receive the recording of the session and, and of previous sessions that we've had. We will make sure that we get that to you um, just in just a few days or within the next week or so. So give us a little bit of time. We'll get all the recordings over to you of our Elevating Voices speaker series. Again, thank you all so much. We are so honored to have you all here today. Um, I will ask Dr. Gabby, Dr. Maria, Dr. Farzine, um, is there anyone else on our team um, would like to ask you guys to just kind of stay behind um, for an extra five minutes? And while with all of all of you, we will just say goodbye and thank you again so much for being here. We look forward to seeing you at our next events coming up in May. <laughs>